Okay, good evening everyone. I think we are ready to go. I'm very happy that you made it today and I can promise you a great talk and I'm speaking of experience because Professor Libo, who sits here to my right, uh, used to be my teacher and I learned a lot from him and, uh, and I'm sure that we all learn quite a lot from him today from this talk as well. I'm going to introduce him uh, very quickly, which is not that easy because he's really done a lot. Uh, and then uh, we'll have plenty of time uh, to listen to his talk and, and the questions and answers period. <clears throat> um, a few words about Ned. Ned is Professor of International Political Theory in the Department of War Studies at King's College in London. And he's James of Friedman, Presidential Professor Emeritus at, at Dartmouth College. Um, he has lots of other affiliations, one with Pembroke College uh, in Cambridge. Um, he taught at the National and Naval War Colleges. He was a scholar in residence at the Central Intelligence Agency during the Carter administration. He held uh, lots of visiting appointments, uh, University of Lund, Sciences Po, Cambridge, Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, um, London School of Economics, uh, Australian National University, uh, University of California, Irvine, and so on and so forth. <laughs> um, let me introduce him a little differently. Um, he has written almost 30 books, written or edited almost 30 books, and uh, almost 200 peer-reviewed articles. Um, and uh, let me try a little bit to summarize or get some of the, the most important light motive in his work. Everything started in 1968 um, with a, a journal article entitled Woodrow Wilson, a Balfour Declaration. It was in the Journal of Modern History. And uh, you could see a little bit already um, what he was after. Um, there's something about an individual, in that case, an individual is embedded in a social context. And uh, Ned made sense of that by drawing from psychology, or more precisely from social psychology. And all of that he developed further. Um, his first book was White Britain and Black Ireland, Social Stereotypes and Colonial Policy. There you have the social psychological dimension even more clearly. Um, he then became very well known in the field of international relations through his work on deterrence, where he questioned the dogmas of rational deterrence theory. And the questioning these dogmas, um, I think, was a very, very important task and made it a little less easy for us to sleep at night, actually, because uh, if you relax rationality assumptions, if you make them a little bit more realistic, um, then uh, you're no longer that trustworthy in deterrence relationships. Um, he's contributed greatly to uh, insights on methodology, on how to do research, um, on epistemology, on ontology. Um, but I want to cut all of that short. And uh, I want to start the intellectual journey um, which, with his 2003 book, The Tragic Vision of Politics. And that, in many ways, is a blueprint of what, what, of what was to come. And uh, the first important book that came thereafter was The Cultural Theory of International Politics. Um, and that really is a major work. So for those of you who are interested in international relations theory, there were lots of fora uh, in a number of journals. Uh, and there was lots of praise. And um, I want to read one of the, the praises to you. That's by Nicolas Onof, who's also um, uh, a very prominent figure in the field. Uh, Libo's theory is already better grounded than anything Morgenthau put forth, deeper than Waltz's theory of international politics, and more conceptually daring than Wendt's social theory. In so many ways, Libo and his theory stand alone. And um, I think the standing alone continued afterwards. Um, he published a book on why nations fight, um, which uh, developed um, thoughts, developed in cultural theory further, especially on honor. Um, on retaliations, on motives that usually many international relations theorists gloss over. Um, he followed up then with a book on politics and ethics of identity, which won the Alexander George Prize. Um, he is now working on a book on national identities in international relations, and he's already thinking about the follow-on project on a theory of political order. Um, 
So perhaps bear a little bit of that in mind uh, when Ned is going to talk now about national identity because that is the context. And without any further ado, I already talked way too much. Um, Ned, very, very, a very cordial welcome. Very, very happy that you're here. And uh, we're all looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. Es tut mir leid, ich muss meine Reden auf Englisch halten, but I think he'll be thrilled that I do, as, as will I. So I will stay with the, the English tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure to return to the Diplomatic Academy, uh, where I've been on numerous occasions and have had a nice time uh, teaching many courses uh, to the students here, whom I find among the most interesting anywhere, given the diversity in their, in their backgrounds. And it's always a pleasure to share the podium with uh, my friend here, Marcus, who, as he told you, began as an undergraduate student, but now he's my equal. So this is, uh, this is a great pleasure. Um, it occurs to me that uh, I actually am in a celebratory mood tonight because the term in London just ended. So I'm done for the year. <laughs> And what I'm done with is my 50th year of university teaching. And so this could be considered the first event of what I hope will be my 51st uh, year. So uh, it's a good way to, to start it. And what I'm going to do is talk about uh, a book which is now written and out for review with Cambridge University Press. This means I will inevitably get a revise and resubmit, so I will put more work in on a subsequent revision. So having the opportunity for the first time to speak about this, I hope, book to be, uh, is wonderful because it allows me to concentrate my thoughts, which you have to do when you give a presentation of this kind of a complicated book. You have to know yourself, actually, what your book is about. And that's very hard when you've been producing what is, in essence, a forest tree by tree. Uh, you need to step back and see what the forest itself uh, looks like. So this talk gives me an opportunity to do that and also to receive uh, thoughtful questions and criticisms from you to which I'm happy to respond and mull over and ultimately uh, have them work their way into the manuscript. So in this sense, um, I hope I gain at least as much as you may gain from hearing about my book project. Uh, I will start by briefly uh, summarizing what I did in the politics and ethics of identity, because that book is the, uh, the, the Grundlage, the, the foundation for what comes with, uh, with this study. And these two books and the several others since 2003 that uh, Marcus uh, noted are preparation for the uh, last book in this series, which is a theory of political order. And I hope I'll leave myself enough time to give you an outline of what I'm going to argue uh, in this book and how I'm adopting what are, for me, uh, radical means uh, to try to explore the uh, reasonableness of the arguments I make. So with that, let me start with uh, politics of identity. Uh, two things drew me to the question of identity. The first, of course, was the end of the Cold War brought about a, a resurgence uh, of conflicts and goals uh, that seem to be centered around identity issues or conflicts. International relations theory uh, underwent a renaissance in attempting to address this, and for many scholars, particularly for constructivists, um, identity became the, uh, the touchstone uh, for their evolving paradigm. And it began to play as central a role for constructivists uh, as power did um, for realists. Uh, 
In this book, I'm going to argue, and I'm an avowed constructivist, I lay my, my cards on the table here, that the way most constructivists have used identity repeats all of the errors that they have identified with the realist use of power. Uh, we need to, um, to rethink uh, our commitment to identity for this reason. What I do in politics and ethics of identity is I fundamentally pose uh, the following question. Why is it in the modern world that people first beginning in the West, but now spreading elsewhere, have made the question of identity so important? And why have they tried or convinced themselves they could construct unitary and consistent identities. I argue that the notion of a consistent or unitary identity is an utter illusion. That in fact, what we are is a jumble of multiple and sometimes conflicting and always labile self-identifications that these self-identifications arise from the roles we play, from the affiliations we form, from our relationship to our bodies, and to the histories that we and others construct about ourselves or groups to which we adhere. They all provide identifications. These identifications rise and fall in prominence as a function of priming and context. If I come before you wearing a shirt from a particular football team and I ask you who you are, it might provoke a very different um, identification than if I come before you holding a Greek flag, um, let's say. So where this mix of multiple identifications, yet we try to convince ourselves that there's somehow some coherence to this, and we do this by constructing linear narratives that tell us who we are at any given moment. And these narratives serve very important social and psychological ends. And what I argue in the politics and ethics of identity is that there are two fundamental reasons why in the modern world identity has become so important. The first of these, which uh, Hegel uh, properly identifies, and he and Kant are really the first to, to write about it, is that uh, with modernity, reflexivity has increased. Uh, people have more of an inner self than they did in the past. And this has, of course, been encouraged by modern discourses. And once you have something of this inner self, you're encouraged to stand back and watch yourself performing. And the self, originally, if we look at the Greek and Latin words for this, uh, it's a mask. It refers to the roles that you perform in society. So we look at what we do in our relations with others and inevitably, we are to some degree alienated from this just by stepping back and reflecting on them. But all the more so, I argue, because the second dominant feature of the modern world is to demand that we play many more roles than we did in the past. Teacher, parent, any number of roles in between, uh, depending upon what our uh, affiliations and, and interests are. Some of these roles require us to perform in quite different ways. So when we step back, we see that we're this jumble of different people, depending upon which role we're put in at any given time. And we therefore feel an even greater need to try to create something that we think is us, to engage in a degree of self-fashioning, to try to create a sense of self. 
And I argue that this is the uh, psychological dynamic that undergirds modern society that's a function in part of the division of labor and economic development, but just as importantly of the role of ideas which encourage uh, the emergence and deepening of reflexivity which we can trace back to the late Middle Ages, uh, in fact. Now, I argue that four kinds of identity projects emerge, two of them anti-modern and two of them modern. So what we have is this tension between the inner self and the reflexivity that brings about alienation and the social self or the roles that we play. The two anti-modern projects try to resolve this dilemma by doing away or minimizing reflexivity. And I won't go into great detail about this, but if you think of uh, Sir Thomas More's Utopia, uh, the Puritans, uh, present-day evangelicals, uh, uh, Marx and Engels' view of communism or North Korea's practice of it today, there's an attempt to deny inner selves, to make everybody alike, to only give them social selves and identities which are focused on external objects and groups. The two modern identity projects vaunt interiority and reflexivity and self-fashioning. They value the inner and outer autonomy of human beings. But they differ greatly in their view of the role of society in this process. So the Anglo-American liberal project sees a tension between the society and individual. And society is a concept only emerged really in the late 18th century but it sees it as a positive tension. Society offers us, and this is in the writings of people like Boswell, uh, Mill, Hume, Benjamin Franklin, it offers us increasingly diverse role models. And by looking at how other people behave, we can emulate them or mix and match and take different features and qualities of different people and put them together in a pastiche that becomes ourselves. And certainly this is how I developed intellectually. I take courses and I had the good fortune to study with some very prominent people and I would imitate them in my thinking. Well, what would they say? How would they address this problem? And having done this for a number of people, ultimately something different emerged that was the synthesis uh, that, was, that was me. So this is how liberals view identity construction. And then when you've created something that's different from others, although not fully different, you then become a role model possibly for others. The continental approach, which originates with Rousseau in France, travels to Germany with the anti-enlightenment, uh, Sturm und Drang uh, poets, uh, German idealism, and then comes back to France with post-structuralism, with the vengeance, believes society is evil. It's totalizing. One must reject it and free oneself from society and look inwards or to nature to discover oneself and engage in self-fashion. And it's that romantic project that tells us all to become ourselves, that this is our primary responsibility in life. And I argue that each of my four projects, my two anti-modern and my to modern identity projects, each generates a different form of politics. Conservatism and totalitarianism for the anti-modern, and liberalism and anarchism uh, for the modern projects. So identity, modernity, politics are very closely connected. And what I try to do in this book is to unwrap uh, this, this ball of wax. Um, I make two, I make many, but the two claims I want to lay out here because that's what I build on in the current project are, and I've already laid this out before you, that there is no such thing as an identity. Hmm? The most we have is a phenomenological identity, an identity of the moment as we think about ourselves. But in fact, we're this jumble, this mix of different identifications. 
And of course, what this means is to look to them for either political or ethical guidance is to risk utter incoherence because they may be associated with quite different imperatives, contradictory imperatives, and which way you would go politically or ethically would depend on which one happened to be mobilized at the moment. And often you have little choice over that. It's a function of priming and context. And secondly, and here's where I go after Kant and Hegel, it is from Kant and Hegel that we get the notion for which there is no empirical evidence that to create ourself, we need to have a negative other. They both stress this, although they both hope at some point that it can be overcome. Uh, I go back actually to Homer uh, to make the opposite case, but also to work on child, uh, early child development uh, and to um, social psychology on group conflict to argue that self-fashioning to the extent it happens is a dialectical process that in fact to build healthy senses of self, to understand that we're different from others but that we share many things with them, we have to draw closer from the very people from whom we're separated. And the literature only focuses on the drawing apart. This is not to suggest that nefarious politicians can't, with often with ease, uh, create negative images of others and mobilize people to think in those terms. But social psychology experiments indicate that what we think of as identities, at least of identifications, form before we have negative images of others and that they tend to be a special case and are most prevalent when individuals or groups are in conflict over the same scarce resources. So in this book, I look at what are the political and ethical implications, both of identities and of this very different way of thinking about healthy identity construction. Now, I had hoped in the first book that I would also talk about international relations. And in the 400 and something pages of this book, I never got there. I did devote much of it to individual identities, but also to collective identities. Uh, this book, therefore, The National Identifications and International Relations, is an attempt to carry forward that agenda and to look specifically at foreign policy and international relations. For some reason, I'm terribly thirsty today. I apologize. So what do I mean by foreign policy? I mean the actions of states. And by international relations, I mean to look at the character of the foreign policies of a number of states. And international society tends to evolve to reflect the practices of its members but also tends to shape them. There's a, a, an iterative recursive process here. And I'm arguing that national identifications are very important because they're the mechanism that lets us understand uh, the most important links between domestic, regional, and international societies. And by studying them and how they evolve and how they're in conflict with one another, is a particularly good way of tracking changes in both domestic and regional and ultimately international society. And by doing that, understanding the, the character of politics in these societies, what the norms are and how they evolve and in which direction they're being, they're being pushed. So what this book is mostly about is trying to uh, convince people that this mechanism of national identifications is very important and it's one of the things you should be focusing on to study both foreign policy and international <laughs> relations. But I further argue that many of the studies that use identity to try to do this are going about it the wrong way because they rest on this false assumption that there is such a thing as an identity. 
Uh, accordingly, the first substantive uh, chapter of the book attacks the dominant constructivist approach to identity, which is something called, here's a big $64 word for you, ontological security. Um, the notion is, they argue that states have identities, that leaders are punished if they act in ways that violate those identities and their policy implications, that therefore identities in some ways dictate national interests and the politics that follow. And why does this happen, ontological security asks? It's because states like people have a need for something called ontological security. And that means a secure sense of self that's constructed through a narrative that tells you who you are. And ultimately, this is a way of uh, dealing with the knowledge we all have of our mortality. Um, I won't go at great length into my um, critique uh, of this argument. Uh, I will only note uh, two aspects of it, uh, that we don't have national identifications, that states like people have national identifications, not identities, and I'm going to talk a bit where they come from. So this means that at any time, states have a number of identifications, and they're all competing. Huh? These are put forward by individuals and groups with particular interests in the hope of capturing policy. So leaders have far more choices than most constructivist scholars have acknowledged. And because these identifications don't unambiguously determine policies, leaders can interpret them. They have a wide leeway in how they argue that their policies fit with particular identifications they want to examine. So to make the notion that there's this uh, hard and fast uh, linear uh, uh, progression from identifications to interests and policies is a kind of parody of what happens in practice. And there are indeed constructivist scholars who are, are sensitive to the ambiguities here. Uh, I'm pushing it further than, than many do uh, by questioning the very existence of, of these identities. And what we often have when we look at different foreign policies is we have the people who espouse them appealing to different constructions of identity. If you were to look at the uh, debate about foreign policy in the United States or the debate about immigration uh, in many European countries at the moment, uh, those who are taking a re very restrictive view of immigrants have a very particular view of what their country consists of, what their identity is, identity in quotes every time I use that word, and how immigrants in their view either threaten or dilute that identity. On the other hand, those who favor um, immigration and are more supportive of immigrants clearly have a very different notion of who they are and what their country represents and the way in which immigrants uh, can be incorporated in a positive way uh, into this, this framework. So rather than there being ontological security, I contend that we have just the reverse in most countries at most times. We have ontological insecurity. What we have going on are culture wars. And what culture wars consist of are deeply conflicting narratives of what a country stands for and what domestic and foreign policy implications flow from it. People who advance these narratives do their best through official memory, national commemorations, control of school books, uh, government pronouncements, and 
what's called collective memory, the kinds of memories that exist through civic culture and the media outside of government control, they do their best to propagate these identifications and to impose or at least socialize others into accepting them because if and when they do, it makes them more receptive to their domestic and foreign policy project. So much of politics at the domestic and international level is a struggle about national identifications which are advanced through these conflicting narratives and associated not only with different policies but with different sets of practices. So if we look at foreign and domestic policy as different domains, we're making a great mistake because in fact they're very closely linked and we find parallels, if not mirror images often, between the kinds of conflicts that go on at home and those that go on abroad with national identifications and the struggles over them providing the link between the two and the mechanisms by which one influences the other, either inside out or outside in. Now, in what ways are national identifications different from individual ones? And here I turn to the great late 19th century American pragmatist philosopher, uh, George Herbert Mead, for his concept of me and I, which I still think uh, to the present day offers the uh, most interesting set of concepts for understanding uh, the problem of self-fashioning. And Mead argues that uh, society attempts to impose um, identifications and identities on everyone, which indeed is what the uh, Rousseau and the Romantics are arguing. But, he says, drawing on the Anglo-American tradition, people also have an I, a reflexive self that thinks about what society is trying to do to it and sometimes accepts these identifications, sometimes has no choice but to accept them. You know, if you belong to a group that's stereotyped uh, and you're called whatever it is, uh, even if you say I'm not or this isn't really what I'm about, others will, will, will treat you uh, that way. So you have no choice but also to think of yourself uh, in these terms. But you try as an I to reformulate what the me is telling you you are, and to find the space in which you can engage in some degree of self-fashioning and ultimately encourage those around you or society more generally to think of you a little differently. So there's a me and an I. The I is always a struggle in liberal democratic societies with people who have resources and education. Huh? There's a lot more space. Uh, for the eye to exist and flourish uh, than there is when these conditions are different. But there's always tension uh, between the two. What interests me are the conditions in which this self-fashioning occurs and the mechanisms by which it is expressed. Uh, by adopting uh, this concept, we can see right away a principal difference between states and people. States don't have an I. There's no inner self. There's no possibility of reflexivity on a state. The body politique, so to speak, is nothing more than a reification. It's a, a psychological and, uh, fiction, even though it finds institutional expression. So leaders may attempt to oppose identifications on states, but within a leadership group, there are often considerable differences about what these identifications should be, especially in democratic states. Within the organizations that make up the state, 
they have their own organizational identities and are very keen to have national identifications that further those identifications. And then various groups in the society, whether they're economic, uh, interest groups, uh, ethnic groups, uh, regional groups, develop their own identifications and hope to define states or regions uh, in those terms. So fractals uh, come into mind. Uh, fractal, many of you may know, is a mathematical term that refers to a particular order or set of dynamics that are the same at every level of magnitude. Uh, and this is, in essence, what you have. But once you go past the individual, the eye drops out. So I tend to analogize uh, national so-called identities to refrigerators on which you place magnets. And certainly uh, in the US and UK, these things are very popular. And family members place magnets of all kinds. Uh, kids play with you know, alphabet letters on uh, refrigerators. Other people put on, I, I want at home, I have a university uh, logo, actually several from different institutions I've been at. And if you have family members, you have all these diverse magnets attached to your refrigerator. And the refrigerator has no say in the matter. Uh, it will stay there unless for some reason the magnet uh, loses its, uh, what's it called, its magnetic uh, polarization. Uh, it's a struggle among family members, perhaps, about where the magnets go, who has space, which ones have priority. This is the politics of the family played out on refrigerator faces. This is what national politics is about when it comes to these identifications. So this is very different in that sense from individuals. But uh, what is more similar uh, is, is we take it up to another level. Uh, we notice with the individual that you have the me and the I. With states, you have regional and international societies versus what happens with domestic societies. So states, in essence, have people outside the family trying to put magnets on them as well to tell the family who they are. And if you think about it, and I, I'm going to elaborate on this uh, more, uh, even though uh, regional and international societies are thinner than their domestic counterparts, they're still very powerful. And I'm going to come and, um, and address this, but first I want to continue this analogy with individuals and states and argue that I suggest with individuals that it is roles, affiliations, bodies, and histories that generate most of our identifications. Not all of them, right? You can have, uh, as a hobby, uh, playing the guitar and think of yourself as a guitarist, although it might then become a role uh, as well. So with individuals, uh, we play a range of roles. So I think of myself as a professor and a scholar as my principal roles, but you know, also as a, a tennis player and, and a runner and various other things. I have affiliations. Uh, we all do with, with family. I tend to have very low national identifications, but various people have, and, and multiple identifications, but various pe for various people, uh, religion or nationality is an affiliation which uh, uh, is as important for some as family uh, and friendships. Huh? Think about our bodies and engage in the counterfactual uh, thought experiment of putting yourself in a different, a body of a different gender. And just how difficult it is to imagine yourself as a man or a woman uh, if you're the other. I mean, it's a very hard thing uh, for most people to, uh, to do. And it, it shows you just the extent to which how much of who you think you are um, has to do with, with your body. And we routinely say, if we're feeling sick, oh, I'm not myself today, huh? which acknowledges how much your body is part of you and when you age, um, and I'm beginning to learn about that, uh, when you, you age, uh, you begin to find this uh, tension between who you think you are and what your body is telling you uh, that, uh, that, that you are. 
And ultimately, you, you have to deal with that as well. And we have histories, both individual histories and groups, and they're mediated by memories, which are notoriously inaccurate, that we <coughs> constantly remake to suit our psychological and individual needs. I argue it's exactly the same with national identifications. They come in the first instance from the roles we play. And there are certain roles in regional and international society that are very important. And states compete to have them because if all individuals want to feel different and in some way superior, so do all states. And it's not, again, that states have any psyches. They don't want to do it. It's the people who constitute the state who want to do it. In the modern age with nationalism, there's a high degree of transference. Uh, the sense to which we psychologically identify with our states, the way we do with sports teams. So when our team wins, we feel good about ourselves and validated and powerful. And when they lose, we feel miserable. The same when our, when our states do well. And for many people, they're more involved with their states than with their, their sports teams. Leaders know this, and leaders know that the states have to do well and seek high status and provide the self-esteem that comes with it to citizens. That it's just as important, if not more important, than providing wealth and security. And international relations in general has completely uh, disregarded this very powerful motive for domestic and foreign policy, which I try to foreground in my book, Cultural Theory. So we seek high status roles. Being a great power is one way of playing a role which makes citizens feel very good. If you're a smaller state or a state in particular circumstances, you can be a neutral, which is another role. And often those who are in neutrals try to, in neutral roles, try to perform them in ways to give them higher status. Think of Switzerland or Sweden, uh, who have played this game with, uh, with, with great um, success. We have regional powers, like India or Israel, who try and achieve status uh, through that role. And, and clearly, you know, Egypt, Israel, Iran uh, have been in conflict for many reasons, but one of them is that each of them sees themselves as a dominant power um, within the region and add Saudi Arabia, which would like to play that role um, as well. Uh, this is yet another dimension, and it's important to these states because in part their legitimacy rests upon what <coughs> rewards they offer their people. And Self-esteem is a powerful one, uh, especially when other forms of validation are lacking because they're seen as politically threatening uh, by leaders. So um, we then come to bodies. And in the case of the state, the body consists of both um, the people and the territory. And states define themselves as Island states, uh, landlocked <coughs> mountain states, uh, and build narratives about how this shapes their character, the Dutch fighting back the, uh, the sea. Uh, I mean, this is true everywhere. And finally, we construct histories of ourselves, and histories that glorify our past, mostly myths. If you read uh, Virgil's Aeneid, it provides the founding myth of Rome and the Augustan age. And Rome is, in fact, in, in fact, in fiction, in his book, founded by the Trojans. Well, there are 14 European societies that claim descent from the Trojans, including the Irish. Uh, this is obviously fiction, since the Trojans are fiction. We construct these narratives. And we have uh, enormous fights uh, over the narratives. I mean, one could look at uh, Austria and Germany as particularly interesting cases uh, of, uh, of memory and the struggle over memory, which isn't just carried out as a conflict in its own right, 
but as a way of constructing a particular set of national identifications which have profound importance uh, for politics. So what I try to do in this book is uh, go through these categories and show uh, how national identifications are constructed in response to them and how they're contested consistently and how changes in one bring about changes in others. I then go to the international level and I argue that even though international and regional societies are much thinner than their domestic counterparts, that they impose great pressures on states to construct particular kinds of identities or to perform them in particular ways. And I'll just mention the notion of, of great power here because great power comes with rules. And to be accepted as a great power, you have to conform to those rules. And if you violate them or don't quite achieve the conditions beyond power, you're seen as a great power with a question mark. And this has always been the case, for example, with Russia. Since Leibniz referred to Peter the Great and Russia as the Turk of the North, it's always been a great power but not fully accepted as such uh, for cultural and political reasons. So if you want to be that great power, you have to perform in ways that others accept you as such. And this produces not only constraints but pr pressures to act in certain ways. You could examine the American attempts, as I, I look at in this book and another, to uh, claim to be a hegemon, which is a step above both a great power and a superpower, which is yet another category. To make itself, as former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright put it, the uh, essential nation. And to claim even more privileges and higher status from others. But this is a claim that hasn't paid out. It's not accepted uh, widely around the world. Although Americans routinely encourage uh, foreign leaders and the press to describe them this way and then cite tautologically as confirming evidence uh, these uh, self-serving affirmations to convince the American people they are, and alas, the Republican Party takes it seriously. Uh, so uh, again, in this book, I try to look at the dynamics of roles and affiliations, and in doing this, I offer, and I don't have time to elaborate it now, I offer a radically divergent understanding of the causes of international conflict and cooperation and argue against uh, realist and liberal theories uh, that don't, I argue, look at the fundamental reasons why people might be dis predisposed to cooperate and conflict. Rather, they look at mechanisms that make it possible. But the mechanisms really don't work unless there's a predisposition one way or the other. And that they can't explain, and I argue by looking at identifications, roles, and affiliations in histories, we can understand this, uh, not only in general terms, but with great specificity, specificity when applied to individual conflicts. And where I conclude with this project is arguing that there are um, two principles of justice in the world, and I, I come back to this in the question and answer period because I'm now running out of time, uh, fairness and equality. And each has two iterations. Fairness says that those who contribute the most should receive the most of whatever reward it is. So the great power hierarchy is built on this traditional notion of fairness. Fairness can also be read to mean that those who need the most should receive the most. Equality is the modern principle of the world. And in the early 19th and late 18th century, s such conservative figures as uh, Talleyrand and uh, uh, Tocqueville recognized that equality was now becoming the dominant principle of the day and all forms of governmental legitimacy would have ultimately to be couched in terms of it. Equality insists that we share equally rewards or that there be an equal starting point that we can compete in a fair way for what can be achieved. 
What's happened, I argue, from the 19th to the 20th century is that the international system has progressed from one built entirely on fairness to one in which increasingly principles of equality are being incorporated. And this is one major reason why war has become increasingly illegitimate. It's a reason why existing hierarchies are challenged. Consider the United Nations, where both principles are enshrined. The Security Council is based on fairness. Those powers who are most powerful and who have most responsibility for maintaining order should have the most authority. And the General Assembly, based on the notion of one nation, one vote, regardless of size or population, and their intention. And you see this, interestingly, and I, I, I look at this in my book, with efforts by rising states to become permanent members of the Security Council, Brazil, Japan, Germany, India. They all, and this comes back to where I began with my talk, they all want to define themselves to make them unique and superior to others. This is very hard to do in an age where equality is the rule. So they have to find a language of equality to couch their demands for differentiation from their neighbors. And by tracking this rhetoric and how others respond to it, one can see the contestation between these two principles and the shift that they're ultimately bringing about. And the more we move to regional and international societies in which equality becomes the entrenched principle, the more the norms change, and with it the kinds of behaviors that bring with them status and recognition. So there becomes this very interesting interplay which gives us an overview of the transformation of the international system. And the final issue I look at is deviance. In international society, as in domestic society, we have those who thumb their noses at the rules and at the society. I was a deviant all throughout my public school, my you know, primary, secondary school, education, rebelling against authority, and I insist with very good reason. Um, I just wasn't mature enough to do it effectively. And indeed, what happens today, I'm unchanged, I do the same thing, but in a way and in an environment, the university, where I'm now rewarded for what I used to be punished. So the difference between deviance and conformity uh, is sometimes they're the flip side of, of the coin. And to be a successful deviant, you have to, interestingly, be recognized as such by the powers you're thumbing your noses at. And the powers that be that want to um, maintain, and this is an insight from Emil Durkheim, maintain their authority in the system, have to police the borders and impose the practices that sustain them in power. And therefore, they have to identify and isolate those who disobey and call them deviants. So by looking at who becomes a deviant and, is, and who labels one as a deviant at any time is another way of tracking into these conflicts. And particularly interesting is looking at states that start as deviants, the way the French did after the revolution or communist China, and then become accepted members of the club. How does this happen, and to what extent must the club change its rules to accommodate them? So I address all these themes in the book. And again, rather than laying out and proving a set of propositions, what it is, it's offering a new way to think about and to study international relations. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot.